Welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your morning to come join us. And uh, before we get started on the presentation, I'd like to take a, a very brief minute of your day to identify uh, we lost a Warbird pilot and a friend earlier this week uh, as he was preparing, flying a very, very rare and unique airplane. And uh, things didn't go well. And we lost uh, David Vopat earlier this week. So let's get started. April 25th, uh, 1945. So almost 74 years to the day. Elements of the U.S. First Army and the first Ukrainian front met in the town of Torgau on the Elbe River, about 50 miles south of Berlin. And impactful in this Red Army's march was the Yak-3, in addition to other Soviet Air Force airplanes. So that's what we're going to talk about. So here's where, bear with me, I'm going to go backwards a little bit. This is this Operation Bagration. This is earlier. This is almost a year earlier. This is summer of 1944. A huge push by the Red Army. Some big pictures back here is Stalingrad. So you see they've made some quite a bit of movement. Let me see if I can find it. Hidden up in here is Moscow. Straight down here is Kursk, where those huge tank battles were in the summer of 43. What else we got? We got some other, uh, this first Ukrainian front. If you can see these blue lines, those kind of differ differentiate the boundaries of the major organizations of the Russian army. Uh, the who's responsible for what lanes, if you will. And what we'll talk about further, the first Ukrainian front. These two first and second white Russian ended up being called the first Belarusian front. And a little bit further up here, these Baltic units were combined into the second Belarusian front. So Bagration, who remembers who Bagration was? Somebody say a really, really old dead Russian. That's who Bagration is. Well, he did something heroic back in the Napoleonic Wars. So heroic that when it came time to World War II here, he got an operation named after him. So they made some major advances. You can see the red line. They got all the way right in here is Warsaw, Poland. So I'm going to advance a little bit on the slides, slightly different slides. Um, the purple is the end of Bagration. So come the end of the summer of 1944, after Operation Bagration, that's the left side, as we view it, of the purple lines. So they made quite a bit. Again, here's Stalingrad, Moscow. So they're pushing the German, German army westbound. So in between Bagration, the end of summer 1944, and the start of 1945, they do a couple operations. They have one up they call a Baltic offensive. They have a Budapest in Hungary offensive. And they have a Belgrade offensive. And so that takes us to what you see, the blue and the green. So that's the front, the left side of these green and purple and green lines. That's the front on the 1st of January, 1945, and where we're going to pick up. So here are the final offenses. And there were numerous offensives named. I'm not going to go over those. Uh, may be hard to read back here. But from the start of the year till about the end of March was what we see here in the brown. So you can see they made a huge movement, this first Belarusian front from Warsaw almost directly towards Berlin. And they made, you can see the lines, the black lines are pretty straight and they're pretty long relative to the others. So they made a lot of progress. And then the green are the final pushes to the 11th of May. 
and what we're interested in as we talk about the air support for these massive army clashes is right over here. And that's where you see the far left edge of the green line intersect with the River Elbe. And that's where the Americans and the Russians met. So I'm gonna blow that map up a little bit. And here's some more of those boundaries. The Army always has boundaries, lines on a map. Who's responsible for this geographic area? Who's responsible for this one? So we've talked about the second Belarusian front, the first, the first Ukrainian front, and the second Ukrainian front. And these red lines are, are reasonable. Now, don't anybody go to Vegas and put money down on these lines, okay? They're big picture on who's responsible for what as this Red Army is really steamrolling to the West. Now, what we care about is there's our little town of Torgau over there under the G in Germany, and we're going to talk about the air support for this clash of titans. So at this time, just like we've seen this Russian army divided and compacted and reorganized into fronts, the air armies, as the Soviet Air Forces called them, has done the same thing. So they have consolidated units, and then they dedicate an air army to a front. So the front has this geographic responsibility, and in this case, the 4th Air Army is subordinate to the 2nd Belarusian Front, and they're going to do what that 2nd Belarusian Front needs. Prioritize targets, clear this space, here's our major offensive, give us air, supporty, air superiority over our territory. So the 16th Air Army was tied to the 1st Front, the 2nd tied to the 1st Ukrainian, and the 5th Air Army tied down here to the 2nd Ukrainian Front. A little bit more about how those things are organized. So an Air Army is a group of corps. There are several divisions within the corps, and then there are further still several regiments in the division. So by this time in the war, for those, just those four air armies that we're concerned about, it was about 7,500 tactical aircraft that the Soviets had um, operating at the time. That would give them about a 15 to 1 numerical advantage over the German tactical. That's, that's massive. And so the Germans, they were organized into the 4th and the 6th Air Fleet. Same kind of concept. Let's geographically align air forces with ground units. And they had about 500 aircraft, most of those bombers and support aircraft. So very few, relative to the Soviet Air Force, very, very few fighters. Soviet air objectives would have been to gain air superiority over these offenses, the, their army offensive, and to, dejo to destroy the German second echelon. So a first echelon, those are the troops fighting. The second echelon is in the back, if you will, the rear area, the reserves, or frontline troops who are moving from bivouac areas up to the front. Those are the second echelon, and that's where an air force can strike back there and they can s deny their ability to move forward and destroy them. Okay, the primary Soviet aircraft up in here, they had the Il-2 Sturm Sturmovik, nicknamed the Flying Tank. It's kind of in between size of a Dauntless, an SBD Dauntless, and the TBM Avenger, two Navy, US Navy airplanes. So kind of in between the size there, it was very heavy. Uh, it had a lot of forward firing ordnance. It, it had two 23 millimeter cannons that were forward firing for strafing and it could carry up to about 1,300 pounds of bombs. So it's that medium range ground attack tactical airplane. 
Okay, about 260 miles an hour was its top speed. So not too bad for a ground attack airplane. Uh, the middle one here, that's somewhat, this is a Finnish flag, not a, a German, Finnish. That's the Il-4. It was a medium bomber. You can kind of equate that to a B-25. About the same size, about the same speed. It could carry a 2,000 pound torpedo. Not too important for what we're talking about, but about 6,000 pounds of bomb. So that's a pretty good load. Yes? Did you say it was Finnish? That is a Finnish flag, yes. Whoops, I went. No, the Finnish, uh, the Soviets invaded Finland. You're going to get me off track, but that the Finnish airplanes bought, obviously, Russian airplanes. So this was this airplane. It was the best photo I could find of an Il-4. It's just it's it's flying under a Finnish banner for the Finnish Air Force. Okay, so roughly a B-25. This is the LA-5 which was a counterpart to the Yak-3 as far as air superiority, so air defense or offensive air. We're going to go out and we're going to find the enemy air force and we're going to, we're going to deal with them there. So let's talk about the Yak-3. Well, before we do, this was still, as it was a year ago during Operation Bagration in the summer of 44, the primary adversary uh, of the Soviet air forces was the BF-109G. Beautiful airplane, but their numbers are shrinking. There were some of the Falk Wolf 190s, for those familiar with the Luftwaffe, but the majority was still the BF-109. So here's a little bit about a combat Yak-3 when we're talking early 1945. Okay, it was designed and initial development back in 41, but due to the scarcity of resources, really the prioritizing of resources like aluminum and the fact that the Germans had just invaded in the summer of 41, Operation Barbarossa was the German push east into the Soviet Union. They curtailed and stopped the continued development and then production of the Yak-3. It was resumed in 43. If you go back to the maps, by the summer of 43, things are looking a little better for the Soviets. So they resumed uh, production or development and then production of the Yak-3. Okay, its production models were, were powered by a 1300 horsepower inline V12, the Klimov 105. It had one 20 millimeter cannon in the nose. And you can kind of see the ports on the top of the cowling is where they had two 12.7 millimeter machine gun. So that's about a 50, 50 caliber. Okay, its strengths, uh, it was introduced back that summer 44, that Operation Bagration. That's when the Yak-3 was first produced in numbers and made it into the frontline fighter units. And it would immediately made an impact. Outstanding low altitude performance and below about 15,000 feet it was better than the uh, BF-109 and could keep up with the Falk Wolf 190. Yes, Joe? Have they had any problems with timing of the guns through the <clears throat> No, they didn't, and that's a great question. The synchronizing of machine guns firing through the propeller arc was actually perfected in World War I by Fokker building World War I biplanes for the Germans in World War I. So that's not new come World War II. So great low altitude performance. Uh, the Germans started to say the Yak-9, which actually came out before the Yak-3, if you see the oil and air cooler scoop back in the mid part of the engine, the Yak-9 had it underneath the nose and so the German Luftwaffe said, you know, look for that. If you see the chin scoop under the nose, that's a Yak-9 and kick its ass. If you don't see it and the scoop is further back, that's a Yak-3 run away. 
okay, easy to maintain and rugged, which becomes on my next slide, I'll, I'll show you some of the challenges the Yak-3 had supporting this massive Red Army move westbound. It was easy to maintain and it was rugged. Some of its weaknesses, very short range, though it was, it's a very small airplane. So though it wasn't designed specifically to be an air defense fighter, i.e. sit right over an important target and defend the target, it wasn't designed specifically for that. Its range kind of made that one of its advantages. So now we're talking come early 45, offensive air operations. So now we're gonna go out and we're gonna seek out the enemy and that's gonna take this airplane further away from its base and its short range kind of came up to be a, uh, a limb fact. It had plywood surfaces. So even after this scarcity of resources was kind of solved by the summer of 43, and there's more aluminum available, and things aren't quite as dire as they were, they still, especially in the aft part of the fuselage, were making these production airplanes with plywood. And under high G, turning, I'm in combat, there's a BF-109 behind me, or there's one right there, and I need to get him. The high G yanking and banking of a fighter airplanes, some of that plywood was separating. So they were having some issues there. The poor engine reliability. So pretty much through its history, the, the Klimov had some issues with it. Good enough to put in the airplane and produce it, but had some reliability. And it had a pneumatics, vice the more reliable hydraulic systems, though hydraulic systems have more weight. They stuck with the pneumatics and they had some troublesome nuisance issues with their pneumatics, brakes, landing gear, etc. Okay, the impact of the Yak-3 on these final offensives. Uh, great success with those other airplanes that we showed, the ground attack, the long range bombers, et cetera. So great success from not only Operation Bagration, but all the way through to the end of the war. So they were clearing the skies over the Red Army. So the Red Army could operate without the worry of being bombed by the Germans. Okay, it could still and exploited its outturn and outclimb the German fighters at low hour altitude. So it did achieve its, its portion of the mission, which was gaining that air superiority over their supported Red Army units. Some of the challenge, which is I've mentioned the offensive air operations a little bit, now we're going to seek them out. So we're not just taking off and orbiting over our base. Now we gotta go out in front of our army and find the enemy. Okay, and then the rapid advance of the Red Army. So not necessarily a weakness, but just a challenge. As that Red Army is moving so rapidly, the, especially the Yak-3s with the short range, they may have to move on a fairly regular basis every three weeks. We gotta move to a more forward base because we can't go out and seek the enemy in front of our rapidly advancing Red Army. So that's where the easy to maintain over less than optimal air bases they were operating out and being rugged were a huge plus to this airplane. So that brings us back to the Elbe River. I've mentioned some of these. Sorry about the map. You can, who, who makes Google Maps? Microsoft, it's all their fault. So here's Berlin, up here. Down here is Leipzig, if I said that right. And the little red popsicle there is Torgau. So that's about 50 miles south of Berlin. And that's where elements of the 69th Infantry Division of the US First Army met up. This is, this is a posed picture, but it, it's got a great meaning to it. So the Russian Army and the U.S. Army, and I'm sorry, I don't want to slight them, the 58th Guards Rifle Division of the 5th Guards Army of the 1st Ukrainian Front met over a bridge spanning the Elbe River, and that was a very significant day. 
Okay, so that's a little bit about air support for these final Red Army offenses. What we want to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Bertie, and she's going to talk about the Night Witches. Bertie. In uh, 2001, I had the honor of going to Russia and meeting some of these ladies. It was really quite an experience. For those of you who are not familiar with the Night Witches, Russia was the only country that had women flying combat airplanes in World War II. And they flew open cockpit biplanes during the Russian winter. If you have any idea, if you've ever flown in an open cockpit biplane, which I did for like 30 years, and I can tell you, you can really get cold in those. But uh, they, when they first arrived, the, the, they were formed in the summer of 1941, and some of these gals were getting ready to go on their, their mission and, and to training base, and they were taking along their summer clothes, and, and they were told, no, 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 this is October now and it's going to be Russian winter. And so they had to take some warmer clothes along with them. But that was really, really tough flying. And these were some very tough ladies. Uh, the, when I went to Russia, th this is a group there that, that we met with. And uh, they, they were, it, was, it was kind of an interesting time because um, None of us spoke Russian, and none of them spoke English, but we were really just lucky because we met up with an interpreter that worked at one of the embassies. So the lady back there in the back was an interpreter, and she was Russian, but she had never heard of these women, so she had as, as good a time as we did. The group that I was with was all pilots, and so we went and we did some things that most people wouldn't really want to do while they were in Russia, but we had a great time. But this was really a highlight of our trip. And my friend Lillian and I had arranged with this. We, we had contacted a friend of hers before we went and, and had arranged this meeting at the hotel with these ladies. And then the rest of the group found out what we were doing and who was coming over. And so we ended up having to get a meeting room at the hotel because everybody wanted to see them. But uh, we, had, we had a great time with them. And she, one of them was telling a story because we asked her, how did, how did you come to do this? And most of them were pilots before the war. So uh, they, they did. And, but one of them that was not, and please don't ask me any names because I couldn't find my notes on their names. And, and they signed a picture for me, but it was all in, in the Russian alphabet, so I can't read it. So. But uh, she said she had a, this very boring clerk's job, and she was just riding her bicycle to work one day, and she passed an airfield. And she saw a sign that they were looking for women pilots. And she thought, that's better than what I'm doing now. So she went in, and, and she joined the group. But uh, they would go out, and, and they, it was a bombing mission. Their airplanes were very small. They were just, like I say, open cockpit biplanes. And they could only carry two bombs at a time. So they might make six or eight runs a night. <laughs> and so they, they would go out, and, and they would fly up to wherever they were, the German lines, pull back the power on their engine and glide down so that they were very silent. And that's how they became known to the, the Germans as the Night Witches. So, yeah, this is, this is our whole group that went. And we, we got together afterwards. You can see it's a pretty small group, but it was an, a really interesting group of people that we went with. Were you all pilots? Everybody, yeah, it was all pilots. It, it, uh, it was an interesting tour in that um, it was all pilots. So we got to, we went, went to an A&P school in Moscow, and we went to an air traffic controller school in St. Petersburg. We went to Star City where they trained their astronauts, and we went to some aviation museums there in Russia. So it was, it was a, a tour that wouldn't interest most people, but this, it was for this group, it was a perfect one. 
This is later in 2005. Some of those same ladies came to the San Diego Museum. And uh, this, the one on the end there then is a wasp. Now the wasps were the women in, in the United States, but they only ferried. They did not actually do any combat. And then this is some of our wasps that were there for that event. And this is some of the, uh, the, the ladies that were signing our pictures there. They were, these were some tough ladies. You can imagine what it was like for them. But uh, it was definitely an honor to meet them. I'm so glad I had that opportunity. And if you ever have a chance to do something like that, definitely go for it because it's a once in a lifetime experience. Thank you. Okay, I'm now gonna introduce Steve Barber and he's gonna talk to you about flying this little hellion. Thanks for coming. Uh, a little uh, aside on the story about the Night Witches. In 2005, I got a phone call uh, to bring the Yak-3 down to uh, Gillespie Field that they were having some Russian pilots and mechanics down there. I think you were there too, yeah. weren't you? Yeah. And I flew down and parked the airplane and um, this heavy set older Russian woman, they couldn't speak English, walked out to the airplane, looked at it, and I, and I kid you not, first thing she did was kick the tire. And I started laughing because, I mean, as, in so many movies you've seen guys who use car like kick the tire. She kicked the tire, and I laughed, and then she pointed at the propeller and went, and I said, yep, you're right. The Klimov engine, or Kilmov, or whatever it was, turned the other way. And she could tell by the way the propeller blades were set that this engine turned right hand rather than left hand. I said, yes, you're right, ma'am. Anyway, quite a, quite a group of ladies. Flying the Yak, uh, a little quick story about our Yak-3. In, uh, in the mid-90s, they had a, uh, an auction down at Santa Monica Airport. David Price brought a Yak-3, an original. There's only two left in the world that are the wood ones, the early ones. Had it shipped over from Russia, and it was at this auction. And people were so excited about the airplane, they said, well, can't we build more of them? So they did. They took orders for 10. This is number four of the 10 that were built. These were built at the Akalov factory. They had the dies, they had the formers, they had everything left over from World War II, and they built the airplane exactly like they built it uh, during the war. And a little bit more on that, safety reasons. I was looking for an airplane, a, a partner of mine and I were looking for an airplane to build, and uh, we heard about a Yak-3 for sale, and it was in England. And a lawyer over there had bought the airplane. It came in a shipping container, 40-foot shipping container. It was all stacked in there from Russia. He'd ordered it, got to England, and about the time he got to England, he got involved in a divorce. <clears throat> so he had to sell the airplane. Well, we negotiated by fax in those days. We bought the airplane. They shipped it into the airport here, and we laughed because we called it the yak in the box. Because <laughs> you opened it up, and everything was mounted on trailers. It was the doggonest thing you ever saw. We rolled the thing out. Fuselage was on a rack, the wings were on a rack, the engine. Anyway, got to looking at the airplane, and they weren't kidding. They built the airplane exactly the way it was in World War II. How many are pilots in here? Mechanics? Mechanical ability? Well, the first thing that caught my eye was a firewall. Now, if you don't know what the firewall is, it's, it's the thing directly behind the engine that separates the pilot compartment from the engine. And it's called a firewall for a reason. If the airplane catches on fire, it's supposed to provide some protection for the pilot so he can get out of the airplane. I noticed right away that the firewall was aluminum. Now, an aluminum firewall in a, in a strong fire will last about three seconds. So we made a stainless steel firewall. Anyway, we got to work on the airplane. It took two years to make the modifications. I want to I wanna talk a little bit about the pneumatic system on the airplane. The reason the Russians used pneumatics was several. One was that hydraulic fluid costs money. Air is free. Number two, Russian winters, it gets 40 below zero. And if anybody that's ever worked with hydraulics, you have seals and everything in there. And it gets 40 below zero, the seals don't work very good. So they found out that, well, we don't care if the air leaks a little bit, we just pump more air in it. So that's why they used air. And the air controlled the brakes, the flaps, and the landing gear. Well, that was okay with me, except for the brakes. 
I didn't want to say, gee, I ran off the runway because I ran out of air. So we modified this airplane that's got hydraulic brakes on it. Uh, we did a lot of modifications. One other thing I'll touch on for safety, I noticed that the main fuel line ran from the fuel tank into the engine compartment and the shutoff valve was right there in the engine compartment. I'm thinking, okay, catches on fire, the burns through the fuel line, that fuel is just going to keep pouring out. So we moved the shutoff valve behind the wing spar, just a bunch of safety items. Okay, all right, so flying the airplane. They built the airplane to operate off of really rough fields. You'll notice how wide the landing gear is apart. And that makes it easier to handle, makes it easier to land for low time pilots especially. Also, when I got the airplane, we were looking at it, the wing spar, and that's the thing that makes the wing strong on any airplane. I got to looking at that thing and it looked like a Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, this thing was built out of one piece aluminum milled I believe you could run a Sherman tank over it and not, and not bend it. So I got to looking at the specifications in Russia. When the airplane was built, they had it stressed for plus 12 and minus 12 Gs. Anybody know what that, I mean, that, I mean, you know, that's unbelievable. When they built these new, they derated it to plus and minus seven, just for liability purposes. But I'm just trying to tell you how strong the airplane is inherently, it just, it's tough. It is really tough. The Russians really know how to build stuff strong. Maybe not pretty like a Mustang, but it worked. The engine, the, the Klimov, there are no Klimov engines and there are no parts. So when we put this airplane together, the closest thing to it was an Allison, an Allison 1710. It's comparable in horsepower, it's comparable in weight, and it was a V12. So that's why this airplane has, a, has an Allison engine on it. You can get parts, you can get them rebuilt, and they're very reliable, un unlike the Klimov engine. Starting the engine, uh, it's any other warbird. To start it, you need a couple things. Number one, you need the magneto. Does everybody know what a magneto is? Do you ever operate a lawnmower? They have magnetos on them. Anyway, turn the switch on. This one has a boost pump, a boost pump. That's another modification we made. In the original Russian airplane, they had a little handle down here to get fuel pressure to start it. You had to pump this thing. Well, that's okay for starting. You'd pump that and then you'd prime it and pump it and prime it. The problem is, if the engine driven fuel pump went away while you're flying it, you'd have to sit there and pump the fuel while you're trying to fly the airplane. I thought, no, that's not gonna work. So we put uh, a electric fuel pump in it so to maintain fuel pressure if we lost it. So, to start it, magnetos on, master switch on, you turn the fuel boost pump on, that makes sure that you get a steady supply of fuel to the carburetor, primer, and hit the start button. And if everything goes like it should, it'll start. And it'll run on the primer. So you let go of the starter switch, run it on prime, make sure you got oil pressure. As soon as you have oil pressure, push the mixture control up. And as soon as the engine stumbles, because it's too rich, you let go of the primer and you've got it running. Then you're set to go. Ground handling is very simple. This thing has uh, a locking tail wheel. It's either locked or unlocked. So for taxi, it's unlocked. And the way you turn it is by stepping on the brake. You want to go left, step on the left brake a bit. It'll turn left. You want to go right, step on the right brake. When you're ready for takeoff, you lock the tail wheel. What that does is help keep the airplane straight on takeoff. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so it's easy. On takeoff on this airplane, the the Russians, again, they did a nice job. It's a stable airplane with that big wide gear. When you put the whip to it, it's very easy to control. You got plenty of rudder control to keep it straight going down the runway. It'll get airborne at about 100 miles an hour. At 100 miles an hour, once you're airborne, you put the landing gear up. There's a safety catch. You move that over, put the landing gear up. And again, a little bit of Russian. When you hear the thump, thump, you move the lever back down to neutral. And you feel like you're running a diesel truck because what you hear is you hear the air pressure. And what that does is put the gear on the uplocks. Now you're all set to go. You're flying the airplane. In flight, very light on the controls. It's like driving a car with super power steering. The thing is very agile in the air. If you took a Mustang and a Yak off at the same time, the Yak would be airborne in about a third of the distance of the Mustang, get the gear up. You could do a loop, come back around, 
and still have the Mustang climbing out trying to put the gear up. It is that quick and that fast. It's really lightweight. With my big ass and that airplane at full fuel, it's about 4,600 pounds, and that's not much. That's not much for 1,300 horsepower. So it really goes. Um, the biggest uh, trouble they had with the airplane, if you'll notice the, for all you aerodynamic folks out here, the vertical and horizontal surfaces on the airplane are relatively small for the amount of horsepower. If you'll look at any of the other fighters out here, you'll notice that in proportion, they're a lot larger. What the Russians discovered was that if you pull, start pulling a lot of Gs on the airplane and stepped on the rudder, it would tumble. Anybody ever heard of a Lomshevok? Well, that's what it would do. And it would stay doing that until you pulled the power off. So the Russians figured out, hmm, if anybody got on their tail trying to shoot them down, that's what they'd do. They'd put it in this tumbling mode. The other airplane would go past. As soon as it went past, pull the power off and get right back on it and go shoot it down. So the Russian had this name that was about this long for that maneuver. And uh, it works. And I had a friend of mine that did it by accident one time. And uh, it cost him a pair of underwear, flight suit, <laughs> and his parachute was dirty also. Because it really, really does the number on you. Um, again, flying the airplane, it's really an easy airplane to fly. On landing, what we try to do typically is to come over the field at cruise power at about 500 feet if the tower lets us. A couple of reasons for this. If they, we call it overhead brake. So we'll come in at 500 at cruise. And cruise, you're looking at on the clock, you're looking at about 230 knots, 220 knots, coming over the field and cruise. Pull it up, put some G's on it, pull the power back, and what you're looking for is 140 knots to get the gear down. So as soon as you hit 140 knots, put the gear down, put the flaps down, and you're going to maintain about 120 until you're on final. Once you're on final, 110 knots, 100 over the fence, it'll touch down about 85 knots. And we try to typically do what we call a wheel landing, which means we land on the two main gear first and then let the tailwheel settle down as the speed bleeds off. That's not typically what this airplane was designed to do. It was designed to do a three-point landing. Uh, we just don't like beating up the tailwheel anymore, and we have to. That's probably the weakest part of the airplane, and it's easier to do this way without problems. Again, you're taxiing back in. It's no big deal. The cockpit. This is the airplane that we have in the hangar. You'll be able to climb up there and look at it. It's got a couple unusual features. The, these two controls down here are air pressure. Remember the air? It's for the landing gear and flaps. So you need to turn those on. Up here, you'll see the throttle, the mixture control, and the propeller. There's only one problem with this airplane. The Russians did it backwards. The, the long handle up here that's typically the throttle is the prop on this. That's the throttle and that's the mixture. That little handle there is just a friction lock to keep things from moving around if you don't want it to. This is the instrument panel on the airplane. We redid it. Uh, all, of the, all of the engine gauges are on the uh, right, lower right-hand side. The reason we, we changed everything out to American is because I looked at the original gauges, which I still have, and I looked at it and I went, slugs per cubic meter? What the? All this stuff, I didn't have any idea what it meant. Oil pressure was in something I never, I, anyway. So we changed them all out. So this is all now American. The only thing I left in here was the Russian attitude horizon. That's an electric driven uh, attitude. The reason I left that in there was because it is called a non-tumbling. You can do aerobatics and all kinds of stuff. Whoops. You can do aerobatics and all kinds of things and it won't tumble on you. On a normal horizon, if you start doing uh, loops and stuff, it'll, it'll just go crazy. But this thing works pretty good. Um, I don't know how technical you want to get, but airspeed up here, uh, altimeter, rate of climb, turn and bank, uh, directional gyro. Uh, this is the uh, RPM and uh, the manifold pressure. If you notice, manifold pressure, 30 inches, so this must have been a pretty standard day, right? It's sitting on the ground, not running. 
engine instruments, you've got oil pressure, oil temperature, and fuel pressure. Amp meter on the charge. And gee, what is that right there? Air. Yeah, you want to make sure that's in the green. Okay, there's the landing gear lever I was speaking of. And there's the magneto switch. Below the magneto switch are all of the circuit breakers. So if you had something that wasn't working, the first place you'd do is go down and look and see if you had something popped. All the radios are in the center stack. You can see the stick here. And on the right, where you can't see it, these are the engine start and the, uh, the boost pump, things like that. What? What kind of system does it use to generate the air pressure? Uh, the original one had no system. They'd pump it up. They'd just plug it in, pump it up. That's the other modification I made. I said, well, you know, I don't like that. So what we got was a, what they call a Cornelius pump out of an S2. It's electrical 28-volt pump that we have tied into the system. I made it automatic. When it gets low, the pump comes on. When it gets up to charge, it shuts off. It's all automatic. Again, I didn't want to have to worry about the landing gear and flaps and stuff. I got air pressure. Unless I blow a line or something, I got pressure. Are the flight control surfaces, are they all pneumatic? Or no, they no, no. They're all direct. Okay. So you're not going to... All right, okay. No. <laughs> and, and really, the forces are so light on it that you don't need a boost. It's just... Up to, I've only had it to 350 knots, but no, no problem. Okay, so this is the right side of the instrument panel I was telling you about. Again, the starter, the uh, boost pump, and those two little switches down there at the bottom of that panel, that's for water cooling. We have pumps on the airplane that'll pump water into the radiator to cool the oil cooler or the radiator for long taxis. <clears throat> Remember, this thing was made to operate in cold climates, primarily. We found that air shows were out there at 100 degree weather and stuff on a long taxi. We started getting hot and have to shut off the airplane. So now we can do a long taxi. All we have to do is turn on the pump and there's a spray bar, just like you stand out in the sprinkler. You've been to Vegas where they got those sprayers out there. Same thing, goes right over the radiator, cools it down. So our, our great mechanics here did that for us. That red handle is the emergency gear release. If we lost all the air pressure, we could actually pull that handle, the gear will fall, and we can yaw the airplane side to side, it'll lock the gear. And the only thing that won't come down is the tail wheel. So you'll be able to land the airplane, but you're going to scrape up the, the tail a bit. Hasn't happened yet, I don't hope it doesn't. Uh, let's see, what else we got down here? These are the controls for the air pump I was talking to you about. And those lights go with it also. Anybody know what that is right there, that uh, yellow thing going across here? That's it. <laughs> Nothing but the finest here, control lock. You can see, you can see it. <laughs> That's a bungee cord. The control lock, we modified that. The, remember I was talking about the tail wheel lock? Yeah, you used to have to pull the handle. What we did is we converted it to a P-51 style. You push the stick all the way forward, the tail wheel unlocks, you pull it back, and it'll lock. So to tow the airplane around, we've got to have the stick forward so the tail wheel's unlocked, and it also keeps the ailerons from flopping around in the breeze. So that's, that's what that's on there. We, uh, you know, we didn't hold back on the, on the money it took to, to design this. It's first class. So again, this was number four out of 10 they built. I told you the engines, the original engines are not available. So we put the Allison in it, the V12, very dependable engine. Same engine that's in a P38, A model Mustang, P40 Warhawk, in a lot of different uh, applications. Modifications, we've talked about most of them. The only other one we did, when you get up close to the airplane, you will notice on the leading edge of the wing, these little fins sticking up all the way down on both sides. The airplane, had a very nasty habit, uh, all of them did, and they used it effectively for combat, but since we aren't flying combat, on a stall, this thing would tend to snap. Now, that'll wake you up as a pilot, but the biggest thing is it was very high speed. At 100 knots clean, the thing would stall and snap. Didn't matter what you did, it would just go. 
A friend of mine, uh, a NASA guy, had one of these airplanes. He built a model, made these uh, vortex generators, or what they're called, and now the airplane, you can slow it down, go to 85 knots before it stalls, and before it stalls, you'll get it buffet, you'll go, huh. It's saying, hey, stupid, you're getting really slow, do something. And when it stalls, it goes, ugh. Oh, nice. And for a pilot, man, that's great, because if you get it slow or something, if you're going into a short field airport, you can slow it down and not worry about dying while you're doing it. Uh, those are the major modifications we made. Everything we did was for safety on the airplane. Uh, again, it's fun to fly. Uh, the uh, oxygen system, it didn't come with it. It had a dummy regulator on the dash. We took that off. It had a gun sight up top. The only problem with the gun sight is if you ever had to put it down, the first thing your head would hit would be the gun sight, this hard piece of aluminum. We took that out. I didn't need that. Um, I didn't need that. I couldn't have holes in my head already. So anyway, that's the airplane. Questions? Yes, sir. How many flat positions? Uh, how many flat positions? Uh, do you get? Flaps? Up or down? It's, it's very much like the Spitfire. They're either all the way up or all the way down. There is no in between. What? No question? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. All right, just a couple more slides here. Just want to uh, make a pitch for our next event. Uh, you know, June 6th coming up here is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And so just a few days later on Saturday, June 8th, we're going to have our next event. We're going to focus on D-Day and that P-51 Mustang over there. Plus, we'll have another Mustang with us. Miss Candies, here's the other uh, Mustang that we're going to have up uh, to bless us with uh, from Torrance. And then if you want to look further down into the end of the summer, uh, September 1st marks the 80th anniversary of the start of World War II, the September 1st to 39 German invasion of Poland. So as close as we can get there, Saturday, August 31st, we're going to, uh, beginning of the war, beginning of where pilots start in the trainers, and we're going to focus on our SNJ. So with that, thank you so much again for taking time out of your day, and we'll see you again next time.